I'm Commander Shepard, and This Week in Geek is my favorite podcast on the Citadel. Hey guys, what's going on? You are listening to This Week in Geek Dot net's botched roll. I am your host, Mike the Birdman. And as you've noticed, I've been doing a couple more of these. And it always seems I start doing these during uh, May and June as things start to wind down as we prepare for E3. But we also prepare for tabletop season. As I sort of figure out, most people are done college or school or whatever. It's a great time to gather around the table and start playing games with your friends. So last time I did a bot roll, I talked with David Chapman, who is one of the masterminds behind the Doctor Who role-playing game. And I wanted to shift gears here because one of my friends uh, that I have on Facebook and I've had for many years, I call RPG Mom, is Nicole Lindros. And she's one of the big people over at Green Ronin Publishing. So she shared a link a couple of weeks ago about a game called Twilight Accord. And this is a interesting Patreon game that is being set up in using the open game license for Dungeons and Dragons. So fifth edition. And what this is, this is a queer focused um, role playing game setting that you can drop into pretty much any other world. As far as I understand, if you wanted to cross this, you know, crossing planes or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so I reached out to Green Ronin and they set me up with two of the game's writers. I'm talking with Steve Kenson. He is a uh, RPG author. He's been around since about 1995. He's worked on Mutants and Masterminds, Blue Rose, Freedom City. He's written RPG uh, tie-in novels. You might say he knows his shit. And then the other guy we're going to be talking with is Joseph... Um, character and he is a game developer <clears throat> excuse me for green ronin he's also worked on uh blue rose he's also done stuff for fantasy ag and you may have heard this little thing called critical role he's done some stuff for that as well but he's also done work for wizards white wolf onyx path and he does a lot of really neat stuff at gen con with the three-sided die panels um and which is sort of a, i guess a uh a queer focus panel. So without any further ado, I want to welcome Steve and Joseph to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Guys, Appreciate it. I I'm excited to talk about this, mostly because I love it when there's new exciting settings for D and D that explore things that I've never really considered. I mean, we've all looked at stuff like Dark Sun, which is this weird Mad Max future. We got Ravenloft, but I've never thought of approaching queer based sexuality as a gameplay or sort of a world setting mechanic because i'm a cisgendered weirdo and i don't really know what i'm talking about with with like certain things so what is twilight accord and i guess we will go with uh joseph on this one uh so twilight accord uh is basically uh a setting that wants to um, not just uh, include queer people uh, in terms of, <clears throat> pardon me, in terms of the setting building and the world building and who the NPCs are, um, but to focus uh, on their on their stories. Um, and it kind of came out of a game that I ran uh, for a local chapter. Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, uh, and the local chapter of, uh, the sisters of perpetual indulgence, uh, who are a sort of, you know, uh, philanthropic fundraising, uh, group of drag nuns. Um, That's awesome. and, uh, <laughs> and one of the events that they did was they wanted me to run, uh, a game of D and D <clears throat> for a, for uh, uh, like six of uh, six of the local sisters, um, and we would do it in front of a live audience, and you know we like sold tokens that the audience could award their favorite characters to give them you know little boosts uh, during gameplay, um, all as a fundraiser, and it was a great deal of fun. And afterwards, we I had a bunch of folks come up to me and say, you know, like D and D you know, the, as, as long as they've been playing, um, you know, has had space for queer folks, uh, and, and that sort of thing, but they had never actually thought about a game that was 
focused around queer folks. Like, what does queer society look like in these various settings, uh, and and this sort of thing. And uh, and they were very enthusiastic about uh, about the notion, and it kind of got me thinking. And and you know, I brought it to to uh, Steve and the rest of Green Ronin. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we just kind of ran with it from there. So I guess my next question. So to talk about the settings specifically, Steve, when you start to write a setting with this in mind, how do you bring the queerness as a story element to really make compelling stories. Like for example, in my own experience, I like to sprinkle gay and lesbian characters in my world just because, well, much like reality, they're, they're everywhere and it just makes an interesting thing. But how do you make a game that primarily focuses around this for someone like me who isn't gay, but is an ally to the community? So uh, like Joe said, the, the difference with, Twilight Accord is that the the focus is on uh, you know a on queer stories essentially. So we we started with the notion of what if um, uh, you know queer people who are often marginalized uh, in one way or another um, you know started out with sort of the classic D and D story of, uh, you know, uh, clearing out some ancient ruin um, and, uh, you know, taking the, you know, sort of archetypal d and um, build a fortress, you know, kind of trope of, you know, when adventurers get high enough level, they establish a keep or a tower or something. Um, and so what if, you know, this sort of adventuring community uh, was also about uh, the the notion of creating uh, a home for uh, queer folks, and from that uh, we expanded out uh, into the idea of uh, this extra planar setting uh, that we call the gloom. Um, that is is sort of metaphorical of, of the the you know the outer darkness that a lot of marginalized people find themselves in and uh you know the notion of what happens when those people bring light into that darkness and decide to set up housekeeping and they're gonna kick the monsters out and you know make something of it and you know it evolved from there uh into a a setting that like you mentioned earlier uh is sort of a meta setting that can can fit into or around any other fantasy settings. Um, so it allowed us to play with the opportunity that there could be queer characters from anywhere, different planes, different realities, different cultures, all with their own different experiences of, of what queerness is like in their culture and why that has led them here. So I guess my next question might be for Joseph. So in terms of, of what the setting represents, are there anything unique gameplay wise or gameplay mechanics you guys are hoping to introduce in this game? Like for example, some of the games I've played under the open game license, for example, experiment with uh, different systems that they create that are unique to their system. And one thing I can think of is the Stargate SG one game, which we just played over on twig. We didn't use these systems because they didn't fit with our style of play, but there was the D, uh, de- determination points and moxie, which would determine uh, social encounters or how tough your character was to do a particular action. Are, is there anything unique to Twilight Accord that really sets it apart from other uh, kind of settings or, or is it more narrative focused perhaps? Well, um, so we we definitely want to uh, to take advantage of the system uh, of the system that we're using, um, and we're sort of deliberately making sure that it still feels like, uh, you know, that it still feels like D and D when you sit down to play. Um, now we are playing with some other uh, with some other elements that really kind of focus, uh, you know, sort of what that play experience we want to look like. Um, as an example, 
um, you know, the sort of core fifth edition system uses a set of uh, inspiration rules. Um, and we're actually kind of developing those out a little, a little further uh, within the context of this setting and like what our sort of champions are there to try and do. Um, uh, additionally, uh, as Steve mentioned, you know, part of this gameplay isn't just, you know, you go in with your uh, adventuring company and clear out, uh, you know, a set of runes and come back with the treasure. Um, part of gameplay is you clear those spaces out and then you make them safe for a community of uh, basically queer folks from from many different places who are coming here uh, looking for the promise of a home. Uh, and so part of gameplay will also involve, you know, developing the spaces that you've made safe and helping to keep them safe. And then, you know, helping to take care of some of the problems and tasks that come with beginning to build community and that sort of thing. All right. So one of the things that I really want to know from either of you, I'll probably focus on Steve for this one. So in creating these safe communities and stories, like, do you have an overarching meta plot kind of planned out for your world because i'm like with like some of these world settings uh that i've seen like like spell jammer or sigil or ravenloft there's always like a big bad or there's something but here you're dealing more with a society who doesn't accept marginalized communities and persecutes them and that's a cool and noble goal but is there any, like, what is a grander story? I mean, other than building community, what other, what other stories can be told in this space? Uh, because obviously like some of the most touching stories that I read online are some people who are non-binary, who are learning to accept themselves, people who were very unhappy before they transitioned into a trans, uh, gendered person, or, you know, just, I'm not going to lie. Some, some of those gay weddings look pretty friggin' awesome. Um, so <laughs> like, what are some of the stories you guys really want to tell? Like, who, like who are some of the characters in your, your worlds who will help shape the story going forward of twilight accord? So a lot of that is uh, in working out the sort of supporting cast of, of the setting. Uh, one of the key ideas of twilight accord i mean like all fantasy adventure games the the whole point of of twilight accord is that the player characters are the protagonists and so it's ultimately their story and that's really for the players and the game masters to tell uh, as they see fit what we're trying to provide is a context in which they can they can tell those stories and enough variety of supporting characters and uh, just sort of story hooks and opportunities that they can tell those stories. Um, so uh, some of it is just the fact that because it's a setting that is focused on queer characters, uh, we don't have to uh, do quite as much. When you, when you include a marginalized character or characters, in uh, a story uh, and it's you know just one or two they have to do a lot of work um, you know a queer character you know or couple or whatever uh, in you know an overall story have to represent all queer people to a certain yeah. degree the atlas you know? effect <laughs> right you know and so there there isn't a lot of opportunity for uh, nuance so far as that goes but because we are dealing with a whole range, a whole community of characters, uh, just to use the first adventure you know, draft as an example, basically it involves uh, the, the player characters traveling to uh, the, the settlement of the, of the Twilight Accord in the company of a small group of non-player characters. Um, so probably about half a dozen or so. Um, and that allows us to have uh, a group of NPCs who are accompanying the player characters who are, who are trans, who are non-binary, 
who are queer in multiple different ways, who are young, who are old, who are friendly, who are not so friendly. Um, and uh, to just allow all kinds of opportunities for character interaction. Uh, we don't presume uh, in setting up those characters that the player characters are going to feel a specific way about them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there may be an opportunity for romantic connections. There may be an opportunity for friendships or rivalries. Uh, but the fact that those opportunities are there are pretty significant. Uh, the fact that the, um, the sort of mentor character who is, is helping to guide everybody is, uh, you know, a, a trans paladin is, you know, just a significant moment for a lot of players, I would imagine. Um, you know, so some of it is is really not so much uh, setting up storylines of, yes, you will play out this story and then this story and then this story. Um, but a lot of it is is just seeding possible stories of, you know, you can interact with these characters or these characters or these other characters. Uh, and that variety alone i think will create just tremendous opportunity so from a gameplay uh perspective and this question will be uh for joseph is there going to be anything that would make your setting unique in terms of monsters or challenges or unique kind of dungeon setups that would make twilight yeah. Accord different from say ravenloft yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things uh, that we uh, worked on up front, and actually I want to I want to sort of uh, touch on something that, that you mentioned. So the gameplay for Twilight Accord um, does not actually have the player character heroes dealing with societies that uh, that marginalize uh, queer characters and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Like there's space within it for that. Uh, but that's not actually what it's built to do. Um, okay. The 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 city, the fallen city of Twilight Accord, which the heroes are sort of venturing into, um, is uh, is largely inhabited by uh, creatures that are native to this gloom. Um, and it's not like like these aren't like goblins and kobolds who have set up you know, who have set up shop here and they're not living normal society lives. They're not living, they're, they're sort of entities of this gloom. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly because on some level, if we're looking at a story where, you know, people, where, where the PCs are coming in and like, we didn't want to create, uh, we didn't want to create narratives uh, where, uh, where, you know, sentient societies were being overthrown and murdered <laughs> by the player characters in order to make right. room for them. Like, like there's, 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 there's a tale behind that. That's, that's uh that's not a lot of fun, honestly. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. So the gloom itself is probably the biggest monster. And the okay. thing about the gloom is that uh, it sort of reacts to a lot of the ugly negative emotions that settle uh, that settle in people. Um, and so people who are dealing with a lot of pain, with a lot of trauma, with a lot of this sort of thing, the gloom will find and kind of amplify that. It'll also use it as a, as a template to create threats uh, and, and challenges uh, just sort of by its very nature. So while the PCs are, are in this, you know, old, you know, uh, kind of ancient ruined city, uh, dealing with actual shadow monsters and you know other other things um they're on some level they are also facing down the shadows that lie within them based on their experiences of being marginalized or not um you know one of the things that we do with this uh with this book is we talk about the ways in which queerness can be folded into already existing campaign settings mm -hmm. you know and talking about there are some campaign settings where you know it's uh, nobody nobody cares like nobody mentions it it's like an eye color thing nobody nobody really cares there are others in which um it's embraced and supported but still sort of its own subculture right tucked away from you know larger society and and, and existing within like a military you know context or whatever 
Um, and then there are settings that actively uh, that actively marginalize uh, them. And so the idea is that player characters can come from any of these type of queer backgrounds, uh, but they all show up at the Twilight Accord looking to create this kind of found uh, found community uh, with one another. And so part of the fun will be seeing, you know, the sort of the shadows that they bring with them and the ways that the gloom will take those shadows, will take those those pains and those scars and turn them against uh, the players and literally give them the opportunity to take sword and spell uh, to their uh, to their particularly dark backgrounds and that kind of thing. So yeah. just just kind of based upon that, I, I can see this game being potentially a little bit more emotionally charged than your typical I'm going to go kill the dragon because he did X, Y, Z. And like you said, facing your own trauma, I mean, coming from a marginalized community, that's interesting. And that kind of got me thinking as you're not going to be fighting demons and kobolds necessarily, but you're also fighting against yourself. And that really got me thinking, and this question will be right towards Steve. We're going to transition mm -hmm. into that. Um, one of the best role playing experiences I ever had was a private game I ran on a podcast known as Terrible Warriors. And I was playing a uh, bisexual girl who was kind of discovering her identity as a superhero. And at the end of the campaign, I did so, I nuked a mountain and I asked my girlfriend in the game, well, despite everything, am I still human? And she mm -hmm. just held my hand and the scene ended. And that really resonated with me when I looked at sort of gay stories in the media. It, it made me really think about, there's a lot of really powerful things out there. And just by hearing Joseph talk, mm -hmm. I see this game not just as epic combat, but there's a lot of really powerful stories that could be mined out of here and stories that can not just confront trauma, but rise above it. When I heard Joseph talk, I got the thinking, you're not just clearing out a society to conquer them. You're creating safe spaces like this. I mm -hmm. could see this game being a remarkable diplomatic exercise and just talking and working out thoughts and feelings. So when you look at creating the stories what are some of the stories that you hope people bring out in this game? What are some of the, I, I don't want to say issues people deal with, but what are some of the things you hope people gather, learn, and heal from this game? Well, I think that, honestly, it's really about creating us. Like you said, it's, it's about creating safe spaces. It's, it's about creating space for queer stories to get told um, and I hope that they are as uh, diverse and different as the groups of players who play in the setting uh, I think that it's really about creating opportunities uh, like I said the the thing that strikes me the most um, is, uh, and I'm going to pick on Joe a bit for it. Um, <laughs> Joe, uh, wrote a, uh, a queer, uh, superhero, uh, novel. Um, and, um, there, there's a bit, um, where a group of, of all queer superheroes, um, are, are saving, uh, a, a group of queer people, uh, from uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a conversion camp for all intents and purposes. Um, and there is a moment where uh, one of the characters being rescued says, so you're really here to save us? And just the very notion of queer people being the heroes who are going to step up and save other queer people who are in need spoke to me really profoundly because it's not something you see very much of. And that's something I'd like to see a lot more of. 
And so I'm hoping that Twilight Accord is a setting that can tell those kinds of stories as well as uh, just the stories of how do we create community? How do we resolve our differences? How do we learn to celebrate all of our differences in spite of the fact that we are such a diverse community? And although we have a lot of common experiences, we also have a lot of different experiences. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of other things. How, I don't think it's just about how we deal with our trauma. Um, and I think that a lot of us have had quite enough of, you know, uh, sort of queer trauma porn, um, uh, mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Um, uh, I think that it's important to acknowledge, um, and to create space for that kind of story. But I think <laughs> there are so many other, uh, stories that we could tell as well. Yeah. One of the things that. Actually, I'm sorry. Let me, oh, let me sorry. jump in if I, if I can. No, I just kind of want to add to, to what Steve is saying. I mean, you know, we definitely want, we definitely want this game to have the ability to kind of interrogate those situations and not even just, you know, in a, you know, things are terrible kind of a way. You know, one of the things that Steve and I uh, have talked about before is that, um, you know, both of us are, you know, you know, we're both right. Gen X cisgendered gay men. Um, and we sort of grew up within a specific time frame, and our culture treated queerness in a certain way during that. Um, but, and it's interesting having had the opportunity to communicate with queer folks who are much younger than we are. Uh, many of whom, for example, did not have the same sort of high school experiences that we did, uh, but instead have kind of come out of high school um, in, you know, a, a, a sort of an environment that was much more supportive and, and it was a safer mm -hmm. place. Um, and on some level, like, it's it's so gratifying to hear that kind of the fights that we've been fighting have taken root there but it was also there's also like a sense of wonder for that right like i can't even imagine what that experience would be like because it's so different uh from what i experienced as a kid in high school um and part of that wonder is also kind of what we wanted to do with twilight accord right because we have the potential to have characters who are from very difficult backgrounds encounter characters where their queerness was, you know, not only okay and accepted, but actively celebrated, right? And like part of the fun stories, the role playing that we would like to foster is the opportunity for these different player characters or player characters and NPCs to interact uh, and have these realizations uh, that, you know, there's nothing written in stone about our sort of place in the multiverse and that we kind of get to contribute to what that looks like. But we also like want Twilight Accord at the end of the day, we're game creators, you know, like we're, we're nerds who, who throw dice. Uh, and so at the end of the day, even if that's not the sort of stories that a given group wants to tell, we want to make sure that it's a fun game for you to sort of default back to a little of the more typical kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of fantasy role play uh, where, you know, you go in and you have cool abilities uh, and you fight scary monsters and then, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it's kind of about making sure that there's space for a really broad variety of stories and that as many of those are supported as possible. One of the things I'm, I'm kind of getting from both of you and this would be the type of game where I, as a straight cisgendered male, I want a really powerful experience and I see such potential here to tell incredibly powerful stories. And like I said, it's not just gay trauma porn because we've heard that story a thousand times but i like i mentioned earlier i hear so many inspirational stories now and even in the back of my head while you guys have been talking okay so i'm creating a character in the back of my head i want to play a cool lesbian and i want to be i like that idea of a paladin but i like the idea of a monk so i'm just kind of mm -hmm. giving ideas just kind of spitballing here but i see something really interesting here i i see this game to be 
something actually kind of inspirational and it it does cross lines where like like straight people can enjoy this gay people obviously can enjoy this and it's it's the storytelling medium that doesn't know sexuality here because all what matters too is the power of the emotions and what you take away from it. And I really do get that sense of warmth, community building, becoming stronger, not because of, you know, something terrible that has happened to you, but embracing who you are and just accepting that wholly within your heart. And that's really nice to hear that I'm not just fighting Count Strahd every week. Right. I really right, like right. that actually. You know, and actually one of the one of the interesting things is is, you know, for anyone who's familiar with queer stories, uh, you know, folks will often be aware of how found family uh, is kind of one of one of the sort of themes like like marginalized people, um, but particularly queer people who are marginalized in a way that often does not include their families. You know, uh, a lot of, for for a lot of marginalized queer folk you know, coming into who we are means sometimes creating separation between ourselves and our families, um, you know, which is, is tragic and horrible. But but we've responded to that by creating new families for ourselves. Um, and I'll tell you, from the time I was a young gay man, uh, I saw a, a, like, connection between queer found families and the, like, adventuring parties in D&D. Mm -hmm. you know, who are made up of, of a weird, diverse characters from a wide variety of, you know, many of whom have quirks and many of whom deal with being, you know, outcasts or othered in some way. And yet they stand and support one another, you know, back to back against the world. Um, and there's a lot of resonance with that, with that concept that we really mm -hmm. want to take advantage of in Twilight Accord. There uh, is... Mike, you... Yo, sorry, go ahead. To... Yeah, I just wanted to touch on something you brought up because I think it's important. Um, when you were talking about the notion of, of character creation in Twilight Accord, I think that it's, it's important that the setting puts the question of queerness uh, front and center when people mm -hmm. are thinking about characters. Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference between a setting that uh, sort of gives you permission to be queer um, and says, yes, of course, your character can be, you know, of whatever gender or sexuality or background that you want um, versus a setting that says most of the people here are queer in some way. Mm -hmm. You should think about that and what that means in relationship to your character. Um, and it becomes a different kind of choice in character creation, uh, whether or not your character is going to be queer, in what way. Are they going to be? What is their relationship with that? It's thinking through a lot of things that can be kind of glossed over or taken for granted uh, in a different different setting or a different context. Uh, and I think that for um, at least my generation of gamers, and my anecdotal experience shows that this still holds true to a certain degree, um, uh, a lot of us found ways to come out through gaming, um, or at the very least to interrogate our own experiences with who we were through the process of gaming. Um, and by trying on different characters and going, does this feel like me? Uh, and I think that that also really offers uh, an opportunity uh, in, in context for for gamers to to play queer characters uh, who maybe like themselves in a way that they are not normally able to express, or who are very not like themselves in a way they'd like to learn more about, um, in in ways that I think can be fun and interesting and perhaps dare I say educational. Yeah, like that's one thing that I'm really liking the vibe of this game world's feel is there's a lot of chance for self-exploration and really self-discovery. I mean, I could see this game being a wonderful gateway for someone who's just starting to figure themselves out or maybe someone who could even have a crisis uh, of, I guess, faith or identity. 
maybe they can find something really kind of special and kind of beautiful here. One of the things that I've found through my experience by being a podcaster for the last 15 years is I've found the gay community for my podcast has been re- is remarkably sizable. And when you mention the idea of an adventuring party who they come together, they support each other, the most positive experiences I have had are with marginalized communities. And the gay, trans, and that community has been some of the most welcoming people I've ever met in my entire life. So accepting, so warm, so passionate, and so powerful. And it really does warm my heart to see more creative voices in this space get such prominent stuff like this, uh, like this Patreon coming out. And I really hope people support this. So I guess as we begin to wrap this up, I didn't expect this interview to run this long and I'm really glad you guys are talking about this so passionately and so openly. And you guys are honestly educating me. So I guess as my final question, this will be to both of you. You can answer, I guess we'll go, uh, Joseph first and then Steve at the end of the day, when the project is all done and the book is off to the printers, hopefully at some point, if you had to dedicate this book and give a one paragraph dedication, what would that paragraph say? What? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Right. Um, honestly, it would probably, uh, it would probably be to uh, the, the queer people who never got to see uh, where we're at now, um, who fought for it to get to this place, but who were never able to reap the benefit uh, from that, Um, who, you know, couldn't imagine a world like the one we live in, uh, in which queer people can can marry. And certainly we still have fights to fight, uh, but, you know, for whom this world right now uh was sort of just a thing of of uh of like of hope um and to see those hopes realized uh because of their efforts because of their blood sweat and tears in many very literal instances um yeah yeah i mean joe's a tough act to follow when it comes to that kind of thing um but I, I absolutely agree that um, there's, an, you know, a quality of, of history in queer culture um, that is another sort of thing we're trying to touch on a little bit um, in that um, because, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, because most, most queer kids are born into straight families, um, our, our culture and our history are transmitted differently. Um, than they are, uh, and especially given the challenges we're facing now about teaching queer history and queer culture in school, um, our our history is transmitted differently. So I think that it's important uh, to acknowledge uh, our our spiritual ancestors uh, and what, what they did and what they fought for and what they suffered for so that we can be, you know, sitting on a podcast talking about, you know, queering up D and D as, right. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, a thing that people are actually paid to do. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's acknowledging the tremendous debt that, that we owe, uh, everyone who came before us. Well, guys, I got to say, I'm really looking forward to this. I hope I get a chance to play this under the right game masters. I think this might be a really interesting story for me to explore as someone who's straight, because at the end of the day, I want a really compelling story and to learn more about a culture I'm not a part of. I'm always excited to learn. And uh, thank you guys for doing this work. I think it's important. And Thank you I, so much for having us, Mike. I Thank really, ho- I really hope gamers get a chance to play this soon. So, if people wanted to find this Patreon, where do they have to go? Uh, so it's on Patreon, and it is uh, Patreon slash what was uh, it? Patreon dot slash Twilight Accord. Yeah. Okay, all one word. Yeah. Yep. 
All right, guys. So be sure to go check that out. Please, please support these guys. I think this is a wonderful idea. Uh, so like I said, guys, I'm going to be off for the next couple of weeks. Well, I guess eight weeks until August. So Alex will be in charge of the podcast while I am gone. So hopefully by the time you hear this, I'm not dead. So uh, until next time, guys, I've been Mike the Birdman saying be excellent to each other. We'll catch you guys again next time right here on thisweekingeek.net. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.